Well, how, why don't we get started with the, uh, this will be a, mod a moderated panel discussion. Um, here we, on the panel we have uh, Roger Ver, who will be doing an introduction to the Tokyo Bitcoin Meetup. And as well we have Vitalik Buterin, who is the creator and chief scientist of the uh, Ethereum project. So Vitalik, welcome. Thank you. Okay, so, so let's, start, let's get started with um, talking about what, what's happening with uh, Ethereum now. If you can sort of get us up to date in terms of the, the newest developments there. Sure. So we're uh, actually getting pretty close to finally launching right now. I mean, you know, we've been say we've been saying that for about a year, and we've had a working proof of concept for about a year. But this is, I think, the time when, first of all, you know, we finalized the protocol. We've sent it through the security audits. We even have a, a test network with a nice little public display at uh, eth-netstats.herograph.com. You can go there. You can see a little view of the entire network. You see like fifty somewhere around 50 to 100 nodes, they're all connected to each other, blocks are being mined, people are even mining with GPUs right now. Um, it's uh, getting, it's like very close to release quality right now. There's just a couple of technical changes and a bit of testing left. So, so this is on a production network or is this the This is still the test network. <laughs> And can you speak specifically about what you're working on with uh, Ethereum currently? So, uh, in currently, I mean, I'm still doing some development, although I continue to learn less, less and less than I've used to. That's uh, mostly Gavin Jeff's territory. I'm working primarily on the research side, so we're uh, still have, so right now we're already starting to sort of develop the long-term roadmap for, for Ethereum. So this is the sort of big Ethereum 2.0 that we've kind of been talking about for the last year. And so, you know, we've always kind of realized that Ethereum 1.0 is not everything we want it to be. It's extremely imperfect. It's uh, got all... You know, there's a whole a whole bunch of stuff now that we've realized that's uh, that really could have been done done much better had we uh, had we started earlier. But at some point, you just have to freeze and actually get some kind of product out. So the roadmap is this, and you know, even back in January, we kind of recognized that there were a bunch of problems that were still unsolved. So back in uh, March 2014, I created this document that I called the Hard Problems in Cryptocurrency, and that's where I outlined sort of 16 problems, so some technical, some economic. You know, dealing with things like consensus algorithms, uh, blockchain scalability, well, this uh, sort of so-called idea of useful proof of work, which you know, things like Tearcoin would be a part of, and. Uh, a reputation and a bunch of other issues that I like saw as being like crucial for cryptocurrency and you know, like blockchains to like really thrive and emerge, and emerge as a, a very competitive pair of paradigm for building software applications. Sure, sure. Yeah. So over the past year, I've been uh, like sort of very actively thinking about a lot of those problems, and uh, about half of you know we've actually managed, I think, to solve a lot, maybe half of them. And so you know the plan for Ethereum 2.0 is to incorporate a lot of these advanced. So some of our proof of stake research, some of our sort of scalability plans. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. That's great. And once you guys finally launch, what do you see as being the sort of the salient application of Ethereum, like the very first really major application of Ethereum? Right. I'd say right now the one that has a sort of biggest intersection of being big and being close to done is probably Augur, which is the yeah it's the prediction market. Aside from that, the other interesting ones, I mean, there's something called WayFund, which is just you know, decentralized crowdfunding. Kickstarter without the Kickstarter, basically. There's Lazoos, which is Uber without the Uber. <laughs> there's, uh, yeah, there's, there's Golem, which is uh, like Amazon AWS without the Amazon AWS, and you know, you have the pattern. And, and for, for Roger, uh, how do you see the uh, effect of the Ethereum launch affecting, for example, the value of Bitcoin or the value of cryptocurrencies in general? So I actually, I actually see Bitcoin and Ethers as being fairly separate commodities and not a whole lot of financial overlap there in the sense that like there's all this payment infrastructure that's been built up to support the Bitcoin network, um, whereas none of that really exists for Ethers at this point. Maybe in the future that'll change. Uh, I really am fascinated to watch how things like Shapeshift.io are going to be able to affect the ebb and flow of these various cryptocurrencies 
and I think maybe we'll see the one that's the most suited to be used as money, to be used as money, because things like ShapeShift.io make it it's so incredibly easy to transfer from one to another. You know, one of the things that really excites me about cryptocurrency is just the fact that you know, all of these sort of somewhat somewhat radical monetary policy ideas that have been developed over the past century you've got a playground that you can launch one in 20 minutes. Oh, okay, and uh, I see Ethereum, for example, as, as a, one solution to a problem where we have, with Bitcoin, we're, we're creating these layers um, overlays on top of Bitcoin, which are, you can think of the uh, Factum or Nix and what have you. Um, but some of those services are centralized in, in, in a way. Um, and I think Ethereum allows us to do that in a way that's completely decentralized, as well as, you know, on top of the blockchain as, as well. Yeah, so, like, the thing is that, you know, there is stuff that Bitcoin doesn't provide. And, like, one, the one example is, is recurring payments, for example. You know, it's very useful for things like movie subscriptions. And to be fair, it's kind of hard for the Bitcoin protocol to provide it because generally people want recurring payments denominated in US dollars. So, you got businesses like Coinbase that are setting themselves up basically to be decentralized overlay that handles that stuff. So I remember at one point I was interviewing Brian Armstrong and he basically described himself, what he was doing as sort of being the Gmail on top of SMTP, like the sort of centralized thing on top of a decentralized protocol. And, you know, okay, that's better than having nothing at all, but it would be really nice to have all these services, as many of these sort of base layer services as possible that actually do stick with the philosophy. And uh, what brings you to Asia? I, I, I heard you're uh, in Shanghai before. Yeah, I was, in Chang I was in Shanghai for the last three days, and I'll be back for for quite a while, visiting here for three days. I mean, I think it's a big market. It's a, a place that's very very, very interesting place. It is a lot, there's a lot of very interesting very interesting stuff developed. People have a very very different perspective from from the U.S. and Europe. It's uh, also, I think, underexplored territory to a large degree. Uh, do you see any differences in the adoption of Bitcoin, say, in Shanghai versus Tokyo, and, and sort of differences in perspectives? I can't judge Tokyo that much, just because I, I, the only thing I know about it is from uh, the last eight hours being here and from reading about Mount Gox. <laughs> um, so, well, the... one, one thing for sure in, in Japan, I think the alt. I mean, sort of the uh, the 2.0 technologies are, are very popular here. Counterparty, Factum, Gems, uh, right. and, and then uh, Ethereum as well. <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure if it's the same in Shanghai. Yeah, so, I mean, I think... So, you know, even... I actually posted a question on the Chinese Ethereum forums about a month ago, and I was asking, why are you guys interested in Ethereum? Did you, you know, did you come from Bitcoin? Did you come from somewhere else? Why do you think people in general are interested in cryptocurrencies? And, you know, a couple other questions of that category. And so, the general answers I got back are that, you know, first of all, there are a lot of people that are specifically interested in cryptocurrency there because it's uh, some, it's something that has gone up in value by a lot and could go up in value by, by a lot. And it's a place where people have lots of money and yet, there, there's also not not very many good places to put the money, and cryptocurrencies just happen to be a very uh, nice uh, alternative that's very easy to throw a few million dollars into. So there's a lot of that mentality, but then there is also this group that's interested in 2.0 stuff and uh, applications. So there's this uh, one, the one company that I've uh, been talking to quite a bit in Shanghai. They're, they're doing some, they've been involved in BitShares quite a lot, but right now they're trying to push into crowdfunding. They've been trying to push into like putting securities on the blockchain stocks and so forth. So. Okay, so I think one of the advantages of having a moderated forum like this is that we could field some questions from the audience as well. Um, I know Kitala was speaking in the back there, but I just wanted to give people a structured sort of opportunity to ask questions directly to Vitalik while we're, while we're here. And Roger. And, and, and Roger as well. <laughs> so there, uh, are there any questions for Vitalik? Uh, if so, we can pass the mic to him. Any questions for Vitalik while he's visiting Tokyo? Now is your chance. Speak up now or forever hold your peace. Vitalik Buterin, the creator of Ethereum, is here in Tokyo in the flesh. One of the most exciting inventions in the entire cryptocurrency space. Uh, we already heard a similar question, but maybe I'll start it off with, look, we have a question. Can you, can you explain how Ogre is good for Ethereum? 
<laughs> it, it's the reason why I'm uh, interested in it is because it's actually one of the few cryptocurrency 2.0 applications that's like that has a very clear and compelling use case, and people can start using it right now. Like you know, with Uber without the Uber, it's okay. It's decentralized, and theoretically, it's going to be more efficient. But you know, people have Uber. So, whereas here, you know, prediction markets are an area where, in a lot of cases, they don't even they don't even exist at all. So it's uh, something where it's actually sort of creating a new uh, a new industry to some degree, rather than just trying to disrupt one. And we, we should make clear, actually, the reason that prediction markets don't exist in today's world is because governments have banned them. But they're an incredibly useful tool that basically allow human beings to see into the future, right? Real people, real experts will put real money on what they think is going to happen in the, in the future. And you can plan out all sorts of amazing things in the future thanks to prediction markets. But thanks to governments around the world, right now, today, they're illegal. In the most fun use cases when you have a, when you have a prediction market on... I choose policy X, and then a policy and a, and a prediction market on I choose policy X, and say the country does well, and then I don't choose policy X, and I don't choose policy X, and the country does well, and then if you sort of divide the two scores by the other, what you get is a prediction on what happen, how well will the country do by some metric if this policy is chosen versus if this other policy is chosen. So you can actually sort of use them to guide decision making. <laughs> Thank you for that question. Do we have any other questions? I believe uh, Natalie. Hello, my name is Natalie. I had a question. Uh, first of all, how long are you staying in uh, Tokyo? And... Uh, leaving Sunday morning. Okay, so it's quite uh, short. Um, my question was uh, on, um, you know, what is actually decentralized in Ethereum? Because um, could you could you elaborate what's the, the decentralization part? Um, I mean, Ethereum is decentralized in the same way that Bitcoin is. It, run, uh, it is a blockchain, right? So it uses the sort of same concepts where you have thousands of nodes that are ver that are sort of verifying blocks, and it's and. Uh, the, the whole system sort of advances using this protocol that anyone can participate in. So there's no like there's no one particular server that sort of controls the whole thing. Right, but I thought that actually when the, for example when a, a bug generates in the whole system, mm -hmm. uh, the the bug goes in the in the whole system. So um, can you call that? What kind of de depends what kind of bug you're talking about. I mean if it's. Uh, so in general, if it's a bug in one in one of the protocol implementations, so one one of the one of the programs that's supposed to sort of be part of the of, of the system, then you know it's the responsibility of whoever wrote that particular program to to, to fix it. If it's a, a bug in something that lives inside of Ethereum, then you know it's a pro it's a problem for that particular application, but it's not a problem for everything else. And could you remind us your age? Twenty one. <laughs> Same question. question. Natalie, thank you. Okay, Jimmy, next question. Um, I'm wondering what is Bitcoin maximalist, and uh, I guess that you are against Bitcoin maximalist, and Roger might be can be the Bitcoin so, maximalist. But so my point, point is, I, I I'd like to know your opinion around the Bitcoin sure. maximalist. Sure. So by Bitcoin maximalist, what I, what I what I specifically meant by the term is this idea that Bitcoin should be the only cryptocurrency. So uh, as opposed to the other position, which is, hey, let's have lots of different cryptocurrencies, and you know, some some can be bigger bigger than others, but it's uh, kind of more it's kind of nicer if uh, it, for a bunch of different reasons, including fragility, including the ability to sort of use current to, to use sort of currency currency print, printing revenue in order in order to pay for things like development and a, and a few other things. And if uh, different protocols had different currencies attached to them, so I guess there's that's so the debate here is in part between in in part the, 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 there's the normative question of is it actually will it actually be better to have very many currencies versus just have one of them and then there's the positive question of does bitcoin sort of have enough network effects to, to just take over everything anyway regardless of what whether it's good or not kind of like facebook so you know on the normative issue i kind of prefer there being 
lots of currencies just be, just because it's, I mean, first of all, it makes it easier to, it, it provides more room for experimentation. I think part of the whole point here is to have to let people experiment on different monetary policies. And uh, you know, there's this concept of stable coins that I'm kind of interested in that try to, that basically you know, the way I've seen them described is to try to implement Milton Friedman's K percent rule. And uh, to you know have the sort of have have the currency actually target a particular sort of path of of, of prices instead of instead of just bouncing around and holding the supply constant. Um, as, in terms of the positive issue, I mean it it depends. I think currencies have lots of different roles, and you know I've even I tend to describe Ether as being more like gasoline for the Ethereum engine rather than the currency to replace the euro or the currency to replace the store value. So I think. The sort of positive maximalist point might even be true in, uh, true in some industries, but but false in others. What's your opinion, Lozo? Uh, I can see why I get along so well with Vitalik. I think we actually share a pretty similar opinion there. The more experiments that people try, the better, and then the individuals out there that compose the market will decide which uh, cryptocurrency they want to use as a currency and which app coins they'll use for apps, and you know the market will decide at the end of the day. Also, Bitcoin is clearly not the final. Last question? Yeah, 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 one last question. Two more? Oh, two more. Okay, we'll take two more questions. Then. Aaron? I have three questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, first one's easy. When you release uh, the, the final product, um, will you announce ahead of time, uh, well, when the date will be so that people have the opportunity to set up mining and, and so forth? Actually, you know, if I would recommend that you get your miners and you set up right now. Sure. But is it going to be like, oh, today it's on, or is it going to be kind of a next week? And there, there will be a uh, kind of uh, announcement. An, an announcement, but you know, even still, the, the most you'll lose is the eight hours before you wake up, even if we just suddenly launch it. I'm not that worried about it, I'm just curious. Of course. Uh, um, the other uh, part of it is maybe a bigger question. So as, um, as I understand it, Ethereum uses the Ethers to uh, effectively the cost scales with how much compute and how much data is stored in the blockchain. Is that basically true? Uh, the cost of what? In terms of Ether that you spend to be able to have a... Oh, so the cost of a transaction is proportional to the cost of running the computation and storing the data. So as as the price of Ethereum potentially increases... Ah, so the, it's, uh, a, the, the, the cost of uh, transaction fees is a, is a market-based system. So, you know, if the... Price of ether increases, then the then the cost of all those operations that's denominated in ether is going to fall, and that'll be released in the, the version that becomes the first. I mean, version. it's going to that in that kind of function, it'll be sort of developed over time, I think. Okay. So you know, initially it'll be if your own basic fee system, then it sort of becomes smarter and smarter. Okay. My third question is for Roger. Um, you mentioned just now about um, any you know whichever the market chooses is the best solution. My fear uh, as a proponent of cryptocurrency is that. Um, the sort of major powers that already have a stranglehold on the finances of the people will usurp this technology, you know, come up with their own sort of centralized blockchain bullshit that they say is Bitcoin probably in the vernacular that people use. Would you support that if the market chose it? I assume no. Um, as of right now today, we have the choice. If we want to use dollars, euros, or yen, and pretty much everyone here is more interested in Bitcoin. Would you share that concern? Sorry. And so even even if you know big giant corporations or governments come come along with you know like spy coin where they can monitor every transaction, that doesn't mean we have to use it. So I'm I'm probably not going to uh, be using that spy sure. coin. You don't have concerns that that might be where it goes. I think that there's uh, one of the sort of philosophical concepts I've been formulating in my head is I think there's a sort of concept of what I would call freedom escape velocity. So the way that I would describe that is that if you create a system that's even semi-open, then it's just it just becomes so easy to sort of create programmable exchanges between it and systems that are even more open, that even going past a, very, uh, past a certain point just automatically means that people autom automatically have a very easy ability to just to go all the way into the deep end. So it's... Uh, I don't... Are you optimistic? Yeah, I'm optimistic. I mean, you know, if go if governments do create do create their own their own like crypto dollar on the blockchain, then I mean, there actually are very very interesting e economic arguments for why that would be a very a very good thing, particularly in terms of dis disintermediating the banking system. I wasn't assuming it'd be the government as much as maybe you know like right, IBM, IBM and Facebook or whoever. Right? Yeah. So you know, in in, in those cases, I'm. Uh, if it, I think, if it has enough of the benefits of crypto to not just be bank accounts today, then it will have enough of the features of crypto that it will be possible to just ex to just have extreme liquidity 
into whatever decentralized systems we want without their permission. The bar is set pretty low, though, right? So. Mm, maybe. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, we will take one last question. Okay, please. So I would like to ask, you know, what's the value of the blockchain, and then you know, how the society would be? Uh, yeah, the blockchain the technology is uh, would be the uh, has a no killer app, uh, would be the, uh, the basis of the society, or the yeah, right. some kind of identification for mm -hmm. yeah. Right. Like so the sort of basis of my idea that the blockchain has no killer app is uh, basically that if you th so think about uh, this question, for example, what is the killer app of just databases? So what is the killer app of you know things like MongoDB and SQL and so forth. You can't really think of one. What is the killer app of open source? You can't really think of one, right? You know what is uh, the killer app of Python? You can't think of one. So, like I think technologies that really succeed at sort of becoming a substrate just end up having this property that well they benefit a lot of they benefit a lot a uh, very large number of things that but they and they maybe benefit most of them only a moderate amount. You know, most things that can be done with a blockchain can be done ju just as easily without one. But, you know, they, pro they provide substantial, they, they do provide marginal benefits that mean that the whole thing, the, the, the whole thing just ends up, does end up substantially improving society anyway. So, the specific benefits that, I'm, that I've been thinking of are, you know, in, first of all, it just, it massively reduces the barrier to entry in creating trustworthy systems. So, you know, instead of uh, having to go, you know, just be, become an extremely big company in order to in order to prove that your service is reputable because you have a reputation. You can just set one up, and people can sh can see that your service is reputable because it's it's all written with decentralized code, and you don't have the ability to do anything that to it even if you wanted to. In part, also, there is a sort of underrated aspect that you can have different services interoperate with each other. So up until now, you know, there's been no concept of. Well, you know, let's say IBM has some service of some service that they control, and maybe Apple has some service that they control, and one of those two services, for some reason, really need to interact with each other. Right now, the only way to do that is to just have network calls between whatever their databases are. But here you have this other option, which is that you can have services from a whole bunch of different companies exist on fundamentally the same data layer, and that actually that makes it much easier for all for all of them to interact with each other. So I think you know for the for some applications in finance that's important just because there's you know it's a highly interconnected industry you need a whole lot of components like you need data feeds you need um, mark, market makers exchanges currencies and, and so forth uh, identity is the other big one. So the, how the society will be like the, the na nation will be the same using the same database. Yeah, different countries uh, yeah, believe in the same database uh, yeah, as the blockchain, so the, uh, blockchain as a database. So. Right, I mean, a, d a database for some specific things. So, you know, no matter how, how much uh, uh, crazy math I come up with in order to make blockchain more efficient, it's always going to be less efficient than just doing it on one server. So, there are going to be things that, uh, that where there's no point in putting it on a blockchain, you might as well just put it on a server. You know, in those cases where you want privacy, you want things. You don't definitely don't want everything going on a blockchain. So, but you know, in those cases where it's uh, data from like different services that really need to talk to each other a lot, or services that really need to prove that really need to be trustworthy and prove that they're trustworthy, or even just base layer things that everyone uses. So you know, currencies are just one example. The other example I talk about is blockchain is uh, identity, then you know, and, and even reputation. Then that's. Uh, I think also, uh, right, so with reputation, I'm sure that's a sort of specific, I think, underrated case that people that don't care about nearly enough, right? Because right now, one problem is that, you know, if you're, if you're on Uber, then you get an Uber reputation, but then if you decide Uber is overcharging people or I don't like their business practices or whatever, I'm going to use Lyft, then you switch to Lyft, well, your Uber reputation is gone, right? So. There's actually a substantial, I think, opportunity for to for, for gains if we have if we can sort of establish some concept of a sort of common reputation system that every application uses, and so that's kind of one of, one of my research goals is to try and figure out how to you know blockchains are an obvious place to put the data because it's a place to put data where or anyone can immediately read it and it's not really controlled by any particular party. So trying to sort of figure that out is really interesting. Okay, great. So, so we're gonna have to close close it there. Um, Vitaly, thank you. Thank you for.
stopping by and thank you for uh, joining us on the, the, the panel. Roger, always great to see you as well. Thank you. Everyone, please join me in thank you, thanking the uh, panelists. Let's thank Tracy one more time for being the first establishment in Tokyo to accept Bitcoin. So buy lots of stuff from her, not just today, but every day. So. Uh, Don't pay your please.